everybody. How are you doing? Hope a good weekend we've had. Hope a good rest we've had. If not, please take a nap today. So, today is Monday the 17th. Our goal for this week is to continue and finish chapter 5. We do have normal lab this week, uh, and small things that I keep forgetting about, I believe there is no class on Friday. It's full of having that strategic plan reveal on the conference day thing. Uh, that does not interfere with lab, but we won't have lecture that day. So I've had to, once I remembered that, I had to shift around my lecture plans a tiny bit. Uh, lab this week will still involve elastic potential energy, so we are still going to talk about that today at least make sure everyone's as familiar with the formula as possible. Um, what we're probably gonna spend most of this particular session going over is the slide problem that I told you we'd cover and then I got the thing back. Um, because that, again, demonstrates energy transformation, but we're also gonna show how friction factors into that. Um, I'm still planning currently for the chapter five homework to be <coughs> on Monday. My hope is today, between lecture today and Wednesday and lab this week, we'll have covered everything. Um, if need be, I'll revise that. Um, but we should, we're on track to have talked about all of chapter five before that is due. Uh, any questions for right now before we continue on? Are we going to spend a day on the homework? Yes. Okay. Yeah. If it's due on Monday, that's at midnight, and we'll have class on Monday to go over questions. Oh, okay. That's right. We'll do that Monday. All right. Do please interrupt me at any time. Now, well, let me back up slightly, actually. No, no, sorry. We've talked about friction. We've discussed that it is a force, where it comes from, and I've taught, I've at least mentioned how force interacts with work and energy a little bit. If you're in a car, car is driving forward. Uh, car has <coughs> some amount of kinetic energy. It needs kinetic energy in order to be moving forward at a certain velocity. If there's friction between the car and the road and between the car and the air, then what effect is that friction going to have on the car's energy level? Correct. Over time, all friction takes energy away from objects but slowing them down and transforms that energy into a non-mechanical form, specifically thermal energy, which is why rubbing your palms together warms them up. By virtue of using friction to warm up your palms, that means that your body has less mechanical energy than when friction acted, because now some of that energy has turned into thermal energy because of the work of friction. If you'll recall, Friction is a force. If you've looked at its formula, we've calculated it. Friction is a force. And all forces have the potential to be able to do work. As long as a force can act in the same direction, the same axis that an object is moving in, that force can technically do work. So recall, the formula for work is force times displacement, and the force and the displacement need to be parallel to one another. So, <coughs> let's say you're pushing a box forward. You are doing work, you are giving the box energy that is allowing it to move forwards. What direction does friction point? on this particular box if you are pushing it to your right. Left. Left. So there would be some force of friction acting left, 
This may be the opposite, the, the opposite sign as the displacement, but it's still the same axis. This delta x is still parallel to this force of friction, which means this formula still works. You can use this formula to find the work that friction does in an example, but it would give you a negative answer. Normally, if you plug in a positive pointing force and a positive pointing displacement, you get a positive amount of work done. This demonstrates you are giving the object energy. Again, work and energy aren't vectors, so a positive answer just means energy gain. But if you were to plug in a negative facing friction force, you'd get a negative amount of work done. Again, work isn't a vector, so that doesn't imply a negative direction. It implies that what friction is doing is taking energy away from the object it's acting on. Negative work, negative energy just means a reduction, energy loss. So whenever friction acts to oppose motion, friction is a taking energy away from that system, taking it out of a mechanical form where it's being used to make something move, and transforming it into a non-mechanical form. We tend to assume that most, therm that most of the energy friction takes away becomes thermal energy, which is again why you can warm up your home by rubbing them across one another. It's also why tire tracks on the road, at least in the moment they're made, are warmer than the rest of the road is. They <coughs> absorb thermal energy from the friction between your tires and the road. All friction can do this. All friction is forces, which means all friction can do this negative work. We call this work non-conservative work, work not conserved, because Energy as a whole is always conserved. We know from the first law of thermodynamics that the total amount of energy in all forms must still exist. Friction doesn't destroy energy, it just moves it somewhere else in a non-mechanical form. So non-conservative work doesn't mean that energy isn't conserved, but it does mean that mechanical energy is not conserved. All the forms of energy that we've been doing math for so far, and that we will continue to do math for in 1500, have been mechanical forms of energy, forms that have something to do with motion or motion that could happen. Kinetic energy, gravitational potential energy, and later today, elastic potential energy. Those are all mechanical forms of energy. When friction does non-conservative work, it's taking energy out of the mechanical form and putting it into some other form like thermal, which doesn't count as a form of mechanical energy because generally speaking, we can't identify it as movement energy. It's not contributing to motion anymore. What does the W with the suffix NC mean again? Work not conserved. This is technically a new variable. I mean, I'm, I'm writing this for the first time, so you're not missing it. So this form that we used previously, this uh, conservation of energy equation, this is still true. I'm not saying this isn't real. It is real. But in examples that we're looking at that specifically involve mechanical processes where friction may or may not be taking energy away from those mechanical processes, this form, it's the same law, just rewritten slightly. This form may be a slightly more accurate starting point. This version says that total mechanical energy in a system before some process occurs, so total mechanical energy initial, must equal the total final amount of mechanical energy in that system plus however much work friction did that is no longer mechanical. So before some process happens, like before you slam on the brakes of your car, there's a certain amount of mechanical energy present. And after you slam on the brakes, the energy total is the same, but it's not all mechanical anymore. Some of it is being taken away by non-conservative friction work. And as a result, that will reduce the mechanical total on the final side but 
some of it is now in the work not conserved section instead of in the mechanical energy section. Again, the, the totals from start to finish are still the same. This just demonstrates that friction takes some of the energy away and it's not mechanical anymore. How does this feel so far? So are they parallel or inverse to each other? Hmm? Like the more mechanical work you do, the more friction? It depends mostly on the situation. Like each, in each individual scenario will have a certain amount of friction in it. Um, most well-engineered and properly maintained machines have as little friction as possible because you don't want a bunch of friction between the components. But dragging something along the rough ground would have a lot more <coughs> friction. So it's going to depend on the situation. Well, I mean, like the faster you push an object, the more oh. friction opposed to Technically, speed doesn't affect the force of friction at all. Technically. Does it affect the work of well, in order to make something go faster, you need to spend more energy in the first place. Right. So, so there's more energy opposing it form of friction, right? Okay. Air resistance would go up because air resistance is a function of velocity. Um, surface contact friction with the ground technically. The, okay, you're, you're, you're kind of moving towards the thing we're going to talk about Wednesday, which is power. Um, and what the, the, the issue there is, technically, the force of friction may not change, like the ground friction may not change in terms of force, and technically ground friction would do the same amount of work if it's the same force over the same distance, but if you do it faster, then everything involved has a higher power rating. And so friction would take more, it wouldn't take more energy away, but it would take it away more quickly. And that's what sometimes can start fires, is when energy transforms or when thermal energy is created very fast. Uh, it'd be the difference between just dragging a piece of metal behind you at walking speed, you know, for a mile, versus a car dragging that same piece of metal at 60 miles per hour it's the same distance, it'd be the same amount of work done by friction, but when you do it faster, the energy transforms faster and you get sparks. Does that make sense? Kind of? Kind of, yeah. Okay. It's a very interesting question, and I just haven't explained everything needed to make it make sense yet. Okay. I mean, it just seems like if you drive slow, there's not as much friction between the road, but like, the faster you drive, there's more. Technically, if we're counting all forms of friction, increasing speed does increase air resistance. So you're not wrong. We just don't calculate air resistance in this class because it involves some weird calculus. Right, but like the friction is being frozen. The road friction? Yeah, it was mean. I don't think that technically changes because that's a function of the surfaces and not the speed. Maybe there's some upper level equations, some calculus that does involve it but that's outside what this class typically operates with it. So I'm not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying you're thinking in terms of equations we're not using. You showed up for algebra, and you're asking about vector calculus. I mean, it just makes sense that the more work you put in, there's more resistance. And you're, you're not wrong. Okay. I am not saying you're wrong. It's just factored in in weird ways we haven't discussed. Any other questions? I do enjoy the weird questions. Just have to make sure I actually accomplish the main topic of the day. So, this formula is more uh, sort of the more specialized version of the law of conservation of energy that specifically accounts for friction converting mechanical energy into non-mechanical non energy. And we're going to, between 
class this week and lab this week, we're going to look at a few examples that involve friction to kind of show how it interferes, mathematically how it interferes. Now I've already mentioned this slide problem. And we're going to talk about it first as if friction didn't exist, and then we're going to show how friction factors in. We've looked at it at least a little bit already, kind of in a hand-waving fashion. Here we have a slide that is five meters tall from ground to the highest portion of it. And we're just going to slide it down the slide. Now, as you do that, you are descending. You're not necessarily falling, but you are descending. And as you descend, what happens to your amount, to the amount of GPE that you have? It decreases. It decreases. Very good. And <coughs> as GPE decreases, and as you're moving down the slide, what, what form of energy is that GPE likely going to turn into? Not wrong, you're not wrong. Kinetic energy. There we go. That's the form we're going to focus mostly on for, for, for this moment. At the top of the slide, so you're sitting up H meters in the air, you're not moving yet. At that position, your total mechanical energy would be the amount of GPE that you have. Because sitting stationary on top of the slide, that's the only form of mechanical energy you would have. As you slide down the slide, you pick up speed, your velocity increases from zero to something else as you descend. That GPE will transform into KE. Even though you're not falling, you are still descending and your speed is still increasing. And so this, whereas Previously, we looked at examples talking specifically about a projectile rising as KE turned into GPE on the way up, and then GPE turned into KE on the way down. That is not only true of projectiles. That is true of any object that is rising or descending, whether or not it's in free fall. <coughs> Bless you. And this spot that I just drew an X over, this is the lowest spot on the slide, the point at which your height is zero compared to the ground. At that point, how much GPE do you have left? Zero. Your height has been reduced to zero, your GPE has been reduced to zero. So at this spot, GPE is zero, and KE is at maximum. That's the point where you're going fastest, because at that point, as much energy as possible will have converted into KE since it's not GPE anymore. And so if the slide ended there, you just rocket off of it horizontally at top speed. Questions so far? Where did that 5% come from and what do you even see? That is friction, which we will factor in in a minute. I promise. There's information, that's information that's not currently on the slide. Okay. I'm going to be skipping around a little bit trying to make all the important points. So at that lowest point, GP is zero and KE is as big as it's going to get. Now this slide doesn't end at that spot. This slide goes back upwards for one meter. In doing that, what's going to happen to the energy totals again? Or not again, but what's going to happen to the energy totals? Which form is going to go down? Well, technically, all the forms we've talked about are mechanical. It's just a question of which type of mechanical energy. So 
as you elevate a little bit, as you go back up, what form of energy will increase? GPE. Correct. In order to rise, some of your energy has to become GPE again. And that's going to come at the expense of KE. On a slide like this, if, again, if it ended at that lowest point, you'd just rocket hot sideways off of it at top speed with a GPE of zero. But this specific one rises a little bit to kind of launch you up into the air, which has the potential to be more fun. In order to rise, you have to turn some of the KE back into GPE. So if the slide just ended there at the ground, this would be the formula we'd look at. The GPE would just turn into KE. And that would be MGH initial equals one half MV final square. But this particular slide, as it goes back up, in the true final state at the launch position, there's still going to be a little GPE left. It is possible based on the construction of a system or what point in time you're examining to observe a transformation that is only part way completed. It's not always going to be one extreme or the other. Sometimes you may look at a case where there's still some of both forms present. So, let's go back to the original formula again. Mechanical energy initial, on top of the slide, the only form of mechanical energy present is that initial amount of GPE. There's no velocity, there's nothing storing e uh, elastic potential energy, which we'll talk about later today. That GPE is the only form that exists up there, so that's the only thing contributing to the total mechanical energy up there. Sliding down the slide, approaching the final point, most of that GPE will become KE, but after rising a little bit again to get to this slightly elevated final position, some of that energy will still be GPE. It won't all be KE. Bless you. And in the absence of friction, we haven't factored in friction yet, it hasn't come up yet. In the absence of friction, this would be all there is to it. child's mass, we know the magnitude of gravity, we know both the starting height and the ending height, we could calculate the speed at which this particular human launches off of this thing. This current version assumes friction doesn't exist. We're going to factor hypothetical friction in later. I believe that the final velocity in this version without friction would be about 8.85 meters per second, which is pretty quick. It's a good slide. 
questions about how this one presently works without friction involved. Okay. Now, friction does exist, and tragically it even exists on water slides. What friction would do in this situation is it would take it would take some of that total mechanical energy pool and reduce it, ultimately going, and that's ultimately going to slow down the final speed at which it can move. This tends to be why water slides have higher speeds and are more fun than other types of slides, because since it's a water slide, there's just less friction to deal with. Less friction means faster. But if friction exists, it's going to slow us down in some form. And this work not conserved term is how we factor that in. In the first version, without any friction, we kind of just ignore it. If there's no friction, there's not going to be any work not conserved. And so you could just treat that as a zero and it goes away. That's what happens if there's no friction. That's what we've been doing up till now, basically. If there is friction, if there is something taking energy, mechanical energy away from the system, then you account for it by plugging in something for the work not conserved term. Now, generally speaking, the formula for work not conserved would be the force of friction times displacement. That's the work formula. Whatever the force of friction is, it does work based on the distance that force is applied, and this will tell you how much energy friction takes away. That's the general version. This question is a little different because rather than telling you the force of friction and the distance it's applied, it gives you a different way of knowing how much work friction does. Someone has already studied this slide and concluded that it takes away 5% of your mechanical energy, which is a handy statistic to have. And so, as of this variable that I left up in the last time, work not conserved is 5% of our initial energy total. So, generally, keep in mind the formula for work is force times distance, therefore, the formula for the work friction does is the force of friction times distance. In this particular case, because of how the question is worded, we do, bless you, uh, think about it slightly differently. We are told that work not conserved is going to be equal to 5% of the initial GDP. That means that whatever the initial is, we don't have a, we can find a total for it, we just haven't yet. Whatever that initial amount is, we're going to lose 5% of it to friction. So to account for that, for the work not conserved term, I've written in that it's equal to 5% of the initial GDP. 5% converted to standard decimal would be 0.05. This is an atypical way to describe it, but it's convenient because it means we don't have to go calculating what the force of friction or the length of the slide is. total energy versus the, me the remaining mechanical energy plus the amount friction took away. So the way it's currently <coughs> written, bless you, is like this. Initially, we have 100% of our energy total, 
95% of it remains as mechanical energy, 5% of it does. So you would count that as like the total, the potential gravity uh, force? Say again? The, what is GP stand for? Gravitational potential energy. Yeah, so friction is in that? No. In this specific scenario, we've been told the word friction does in terms of GPP. That's not a regular thing, so that's kind of part of the riddle of this particular question. Okay. But G, the force, the, the work that friction does is not in usually in terms of GPP. GPP and the work of friction are separate things, we just happen to know one of them in terms of the other in this example. So, in general, when you're looking at your homework questions, it's not always going to describe it that way. There's going to be other ways friction is described. Does that address the concern? Okay. And again, in reference to the formula, it's oriented this way so that the math works out. If it helps, if you were to take that 5% and move it to the other side, the total minus the percentage lost is the percentage left. So it's just a consequence of how it's arranged. So how friction's factored in will look a little different each time. This is just how we're factoring it in here. We'll work other examples so that you see other cases of it. this term in that represents the energy lost to friction will eventually have the effect of reducing that final launch speed. So by introducing this friction term, we would end up subtracting it over to the left side, like how we subtract the remaining GPD over to the left side. And that reduces the amount of energy that's remaining to contribute to the kinetic energy velocity. taken everything from the right that isn't the KV term, brought it over to the left, this shows that this, this initial GPE term represents the total initial amount of energy present. Friction is taking away from that total and rising up to one meter in height at the end is also taking away from that total. Both of these things end up reducing your final launch speed because they take energy out of the total that could become KE. 
After factoring that friction in, the total final velocity is still pretty good, but it is reduced compared to what it would be if friction didn't exist. anything in your notes. I'm just showing what terms would not be present in that case. At the bottom of the slide, since you don't rise back one meter in the air, that term would go away. And then if you wanted to factor that with or without friction, that would determine whether or not this term is there. With friction, leave this term in without friction, take it out. <coughs> Bless you. <coughs> this is just one example. We're going to keep doing more between lab and uh, Wednesday lecture this week. So, Again, if something feels weird at first, it's fine, I promise. We'll do more examples, we'll talk about our homework as well. But at this particular moment, how does this feel? Okay, light nodding, just see. All right, we will stop that example here and switch gears a little bit. One, so you can digest this information, and two, so that you can have so that I know for a fact we've talked about the formulas for E to E before lab this week. So, let's introduce a third form of mechanical energy so that you can recognize it and begin using it when it shows up in lab. This is another form of mechanical energy, which means it's another type that could be factored into total ME initial or total ME final. So this is a form of motion energy. Elastic potential energy is a form of potential, like GPT, which means it is stored energy. It's specifically energy that is stored within the deformation of an elastic object. Now there were two at least two science terms in that definition. So the definition that we will use for deformation is that an object, an object, sorry, rewind. I'm gonna define elastic first, actually. In terms of physics, an elastic object is one that is able to deform and then of its own power, go back to normal. There's Loads of objects that can deform. You can hit a rock with a hammer and break a piece off, and that object is now, scientifically speaking, deformed. It's not in the same shape it was originally. But rocks don't go back to normal after you break pieces off of them. Metal doesn't usually go back to normal if you punch a hole in it. Whereas springs and rubber bands and most sports equipment, when when deformed, goes back to its original shape. Ow. So definition of elastic is an object that can stretch either by extension or compression and then return to its normal form. Uh, the physics definition or deformation is just, its shape is changed in some way, shape, or form, usually by making it either longer or compressing it to be smaller. So elastic objects, when either stretched or compressed, return to their normal shape, completely of their own volition. And when an elastic object is deformed in any way, shape, or form, either stretching it or compressing it, it stores energy inside of itself 
as that happens. Um, whenever you pull back on a spring or a rubber band, you are storing energy in it that is released when it goes back to normal. And this is the principle behind every slingshot, behind every spring-loaded marble cannon. When I release this, I'm not going to do it because I don't want to hurt myself. Um, when I, if I were to release this, the spring would rock it forwards because it had EPE inside of it that converts into KE once released. And so that's where the energy comes from when you release a rubber band or a loaded spring. It's literally stored in the object until it is released to do something. Uh, this is the way the spring-loaded marble cannons worked that we used in the first two labs of this semester. When you would load them and then press in with the plunger to set it to either short, medium, or long, you were compressing a spring inside of the cannon. And each setting you pushed further inwards compressed the spring more such that when it was released, it had more energy stored inside of it and would launch outwards and send that energy into the marble, allowing it to move. So any object that can deform and go back to its original shape can store elastic potential energy inside of itself. The formula for elastic potential energy, EPE, is equal to 1 half times K which I'll explain in a minute, times x squared. This x term is the magnitude of deformation. This is the number that represents, it's the distance of either stretch or compression. So this is not to scale, but let's just say this spring is one meter long. It starts at one meter long, I stretch it, and now it's one meter longer. It grew by one meter. I plug in one meter into the x part right there. If I made it two meters longer, I would put a two there instead, and the object would have four times as much energy stored inside of it, since that stretch term is squared. It's important to note that this x is very specifically the amount of deformation from its original state. It's not the final length, it's how much longer is it or how much smaller is it if you're compressing. So if this spring starts at one meter long and I stretch it to make it three meters long, what's the deformation? Two. It's two meters longer than it was and that's the number you plug in. It's not final length, it's change. This is also true for objects that compress and go back to normal. That's how all super bouncy balls and sports equipment works. Um, when you throw a basketball straight down onto the floor, this happens faster than the human eye can track, but it does technically squash a little bit in the moment it makes contact with the ground. And in that moment, all of the kinetic energy it had on the way down becomes EPE for a second. And you know this because for that split second, it's not moving anymore. It has an instantaneous velocity of zero because all the KE it had is EPE for the moment it's squashed against the ground. Then it springs back into its original shape, and that EPE is released back into KE, and that's why it moves up from the floor. So when we stretch something and we use whole numbers, but when we squish something, do we use fractions? You would still measure the distance it shrinks. So this is technically this spring's original shape. Right. But imagine it's normally one meter long, and I compress it to be half a meter long. The amount of that compression would be half a meter. In the case of a basketball, let's say it's normally 50 centimeters in diameter, and in the moment it hits the floor, it shrinks to 20. The deformation would be 30 centimeters. Okay. And this really does happen faster than the eye can track. I've never seen this happen outside of a freeze frame video with my own eyes, but I promise it does. So, uh, EPE 
it depends on how much the object is stretched. The more you stretch it, the more you compress it, the more energy is stored inside of it. That's why if you pull further back on a slingshot, it tends to launch things faster. The other term here is this K value, and this is another unique constant that you will never have to memorize one of. This is the spring constant of the particular elastic object that you're looking at. Every elastic object has a different, unique spring constant that represents how elastic it is. So that K term is what factors in specifically what this spring is like versus any other spring. If you've dealt with many rubber bands or many, like, of any of the super bouncy balls that you might get at like a grocery store, put the quarter in, crank, and you get a toy machines, they all tend to behave differently. Different rubber bands stretch better than others, different uh, super bouncy balls bounce better than others. This, the spring constant is what factors that in. The magnitude of, some, of a particular object's spring constant is a function of how much force it takes to deform it by a certain amount. For example, if we're studying the spring constant of this spring, if I pull on it with a force of one newton and it grows by one meter, one newton over one meter would be a spring constant of one newton per meter. It takes one newton to stretch it by one meter. Whereas, if I took a different spring, stretched it to the same length, but it took 10 newtons, it took more force to stretch the different spring, that would be 10 over 1, it'd have a spring constant of 10 newtons per meter. That spring is, it, it takes more force in order to stretch it. But that also means that it, one, is able to exert more force back on me, because like how ropes exert tension, if I pull outwards on a spring, the spring exerts force back. So this spring constant formula can be rearranged to tell you how much force the spring exerts back when it's stretched a certain amount. And if it has a higher spring constant, not only does it take more force to stretch, it takes, it then fights back with more force. Again, Newton's third law, tension. Higher spring constant means it's able to fight back more, and a higher spring constant means it stores more energy inside of itself while it is deformed in some way. We will be examining a few springs, and you'll be calculating at least one spring constant as a part of the lab today. And we'll continue looking at examples of various energy transformations and how friction factors in later this week. Um, We'll also talk about power. I'm rambling at this point. Have a wonderful day. Let me know if you need anything.